Welcome to Forward Obsessed, where we talk to breakthrough business leaders and rising entrepreneurs about their journeys, origin stories, and aha moments. Progress, pitfalls, and pivots. Business is a roller coaster, folks. Strap in, there's only one direction, and it's forward. Hosted by Pete Senna and David Salinas. Hey everybody, thanks so much for tuning into Ford Obsessed. You are gonna absolutely love this conversation that we had today with Jenny Lawton. Jenny is a fantastic and amazing human being and a seasoned and experienced executive and investor. Jenny's gonna talk about many of the different pivots and pitfalls, both in her personal life with some of the struggles she had, raising a family, going through a hard divorce, as well as just transformational moments in communities. Everything from what it was like to be a CEO that took a company public all the way to what it's like to own a coffee shop and bookstore in, in her local community. So this story is incredible. There's some amazing and amazing moments in it. And I want to wish everybody a great episode. Hey everybody, welcome to Ford Obsessed. We've got a really, really awesome conversation with, with Jenny Lawton today, who is now the Executive Vice President at Bolster, but she's had an incredible set of, of roles and things. So we're going to get into that journey. So welcome to the Ford Obsessed show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. No, I remember seeing you speak a couple of years ago, and this is before this podcast was in existence, and I'm like, just a really captivating speaker. And, you know, it's just sort of back in my head. And then when, the, when your name came back up, I was like, oh, this is going to be a really exciting conversation. So tell the audience a little bit about you, just, you know, the, the, the long, exciting meandering journey that we talk about. Right? Oh, it's funny when you get, you know, when you get through your life, I don't always know that it's, it, it always feels like it's long, exciting, but, um, I appreciate that you, that you say that. So, um, I live in Connecticut. I I've lived in Connecticut longer than I've ever lived anywhere my entire life. Um, and it's the one state I always swore that I would never live in. So, <laughs> um, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Connecticut though, as a result. So I, uh. I've had a long career arc and um, started out uh, started out as a technology person with an applied uh, applied math major and out of college and um, have been bopping around doing interesting technology things ever since. I uh, am the mother of of two children of my own, two stepchildren, and um, five dogs. So um, I'll, awesome. I'll talk more about myself as as we go through this. Indeed. So let's get right into it. You have had an incredible career. Uh, you started your own company when I believe you were in your twenties mm -hmm. and you had just had a child, um, which is sort of unheard of in, in most cases. Um, especially back then. Yeah. You, I'd imagine that was a struggle, uh, to grow that business. You, you did sell it, correct? Correct. Yeah. And, um, you know, what was it like sort of what were the things that you had to tell yourself on a on a daily basis to make sure that you could get through raising your child raising this business because the business is a child in a in a sense right <laughs> um it, it was interesting when i saw that 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 was a question that you might ask i um i don't think anyone's asked me about that time quite that specifically before um and i don't I, I haven't really thought of it like that as well. Like I was pretty young. I think I was 27. Um, my first child was, um, probably eight months old and I probably made double what my husband did at that time. So, um, it was a pretty big deal that, that our company, our company had just gone under and I was looking for what to do next. Um, and it spun off into about 10 different companies and they all wanted me to come work for them. Um, and I just got this idea that I could go work for all of them if I started my own business and, um, contracted with them. And so I just did that. Uh, and I, my, I remember going home and my husband saying, you're going to do what? Like, you don't know anything about this. Um, and I just, I said, it'll be fine. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not worried about it. We have customers, you know, I'll figure it out along the way. Um, I have a couple of friends who can help. And, um, so the idea of doing it just felt sort of natural. And I think when I look back, I'd always sort of had little businesses of my own. I, uh, as a kid, I, I ran a, a business, um, doing birthday parties for people. And I, I was a pretty heavy baby babysitter, made a lot of money. Um, even in the days when you got paid a dollar an hour, not like today, I think kids get like 20 bucks an hour. Um, 
in college, I started a dessert place, uh, you know, basically started a, a mini cafe on the college campus and, and did that. And so I've always sort of done things on my own. So I think it felt natural to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, I was brought up by a mother who told me I could do whatever I wanted to do mm -hmm. um, all my life. I mean, I'm the child, child of the 60s uh, when women were just getting some rights that uh, they don't have anymore. Um, yeah. and, um, and so my mother was very, uh, very clear about making sure that I was able to make my own way. And so I felt pretty confident that I could. What was that first spark for you? Besides, obviously it sounds like your mother had a big influence on you that made you have the bug, as I call it, to, to dive into entrepreneurship and to start those different types of businesses. Like what was the, that moment for you where you're like, I'm going to forge my own path in, in the early, the early onset of it? Yeah, I don't think I would have done it if I hadn't have just come out of a company that was an entrepreneurial company. So I was working for a company called Stardent Computer. It was founded by Bill Paduska, who founded Prime and Apollo. So really early computing days. Um, and it was the first, it was my third or it was my fourth job out of college. Um, but it was the first time I'd worked for what I would call an entrepreneur. Like Bill, Bill was a pretty well known entrepreneur. He he had venture funding. We got free t shirts. Um, <laughs> you know, we had like cool office hours. Like we were a merger between a company on the East Coast and the West Coast. And it was before Silicon Valley was really ha had really taken off. Like I remember going out to Silicon Valley, um, not it, going out to Silicon Valley and working out there in uh, San Jose was like a, a wasteland. There was just nothing. It was before it was developed. So like really, really early days in the technology space. Um, and it just felt like I loved working for this this entrepreneur. Like the, it was a new word. I love the energy of it. I love that the freedom that we had. I love the the focus on innovation. Um, and I loved the learning that that you got from it. And we were all, all participated in it. So I think that was thing one. Thing two is my father-in-law at the time um, had a newsletter. Like he had his own business where he wrote a newsletter about the technology world, um, and it was called Computer Services Report. And it was before, look, I was working before like you know word processing was a big thing. He used to write this newsletter and mock it up on like you'd paste it down and you sure. go and get it copied. And um, like he worked, he he was an analyst basically, and he was in like what Gartner would do now. Absolutely. So I also had this sense of the rest of the world that I that I hadn't really explored yet, um, and it it just felt intriguing to me. That's awesome. I love I I love that energy of entrepreneurship. I wrote that down. I'm like, what did that energy feel like for you? Because I, I often ask entrepreneurs that, and then I know we'll keep moving, but I want to just, what does the energy of entrepreneurship feel like? Because it sounds like when you were exposed to that through those two experiences you just mentioned, it just something clicked in you and, and drove you. Yeah, definitely. So like before, before I worked at Stardust, I worked at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, which um, I mean, super cool place. Like you it's one of the still one of the best learning experiences I've ever had. Like really serious learning is it, it's a joint venture between all the branches of the military and MIT and was all creating prototypes, um, mainly in the defense space. But there was just no way that you were included in everything that was going on, that there was transparency of information. As a matter of fact, I worked on a black project that, that was on a floor that didn't exist that um, when there was a gas leak one day, they didn't come evacuate us because like we just weren't on the list. Um, so it wow. went from that to like having all hands meetings where you saw what the financials were of the company and you like, you, know, you shared what was going on and you knew what the roadmap was. And, um, we had milk and cookies and, uh, you know, we all participated. And I think that that was the energy. Um, and also the energy that we were doing something that wasn't quite done yet. Mm. Like it, it was, it was new. It was on the edge of, we were. Stardent was a computer that made a high-end graphics workstation before, like right as Silicon um, Silicon Graphics and, yeah, and Sun were coming. So, like we were a first in we were a first in market. We um, we made a computer that uh, allowed you to do really heavy graphics processing, and um, part of the one of the outputs of it that most people could identify with is there's a map of the world from them that has no cloud cover, and it's from um, it's from our computer where we are able to have the level of storage that you would have to be able to to be able to do that sort of processing. Today, it's no like your phone probably does what what the right. what the computers did, but then they, it was something new and on the edge. So you felt like you were doing something on the edge. I love, I love cool. that. Like early days of GPUs. Now, like GPUs are like the big buzzword today in 2022. 
but you were at the advent of it when it was first happening. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So, but this company that you're at went under. Yeah. <laughs> so you went from sort of the, this, this one world into this entrepreneurial world and then you saw a failure. How did, but it didn't, that didn't shape, that didn't change things for you because you still went into entrepreneurship after that. What did that, how did that happen? Because normally some people would get really spooked if they saw something go, a ship go down. Right. So I don't think I felt like it was the ship going down. Okay. Um, I, you know, I guess, is it a defense mechanism to say it wasn't a failure? Um, it's so they'd been invested in by, by an investor who was a pretty aggressive investor and uh, we missed our we missed our our covenants, mm -hmm. and they called us on them. And there's uh, early days of investing, so like you know, they were they were uh, uh, it was a Kubota it was Kubota Kubota tra uh, you know like you see Kubota yeah. tractors. So at that time, there were a lot of Japanese companies coming into America, mm -hmm. doing pretty aggressive investing, and they were really looking for IP and technology companies. So that that's that's sort of the genesis of what happened. So I didn't look at it as a, as much of a failure as we we'd had a miss. They called the they called us on it, and the business continued. So that's part of also why I didn't see this failure. It Got continued it. and it divided. So it continued. Kubota uh, continued as Kubota Computer, the, so the, they continue making the computers. Mm -hmm. And then uh, AVS, which is Advanced Vis Visualization Systems, was the Viz software that spun off out of it, and it had its own life. Got it. So I actually, and then like I had a company, there were a couple of other companies. I looked at that as sort of uh, success. Yeah, you just, you ran into a different form of business, a very aggressive type of business, I guess, and, and with the investor where they called you on your covenants. Right. It scares like, us. It's like the old science statement, matters not created or destroyed is just rearranged. It sounded like the yeah. tick on this own thing. So like the surface area got, got larger and they were all my clients. So like to, to me, that was also like I supported AVS and I supported Kubota and I supported the other companies that spun off out of it. Mm-hmm. What, and then, what, what type of a capacity did you support them? So the company that I found, and this sounds super boring now, like, so you'd be like, well, that's a really boring business, but. Nothing's um, boring to me. I haven't been bored since I was probably seven years old. So <laughs> <laughs> and try it's, me. It's, it's interesting because it's kind of relevant to what I'm doing now, but um, it was a company called Net Daemon's Associates. Play on words. Uh, a daemon is a process that runs in Unix. It keeps things working. So we kept networks working. It was outsourced network administration company. And we provided outsourced support on a variable time basis. So anywhere from four hours a week to, you know, however many people you wanted in a week. So you're like an um, outsourced knock, basically. It was, it was no outsourced. So then, back then, the internet didn't exist. And there was no standardization of, of um, Ethernet. So like you could buy an Ethernet card and it was proprietary and wouldn't talk to another Ethernet card. And so managing a network was pretty complicated. Computers came without networking in them. Apples, Apples spoke local talk instead of um, TCP IP. Hmm. So um, there was a lot of work to manage a network. And it was, uh, you know, tended to be server, client, client server oriented. It was before the cloud really existed. Mm -hmm. A network administrator was really important in a company, but they had a very uh, short shelf life. They they had very, very high turnover rate. And in startups, it was almost always, not unlike today, the CEO who would manage the network. They put everything together, they'd buy the computers, they'd make the accounts, and it was, you know, a good amount of time in their week. Um, and my positioning was that that wasn't a really good use of a CEO's time so that you could hire one of us and you would have continuity because whenever we could change someone out in the contract, but we would document everything and you'd be able to have continuity in what you did. So at the time there, outsourcing wasn't a thing. Um, it, it just was not a concept. Um, so it was a really new concept that you could do something on a variable time basis. You could buy chunks of people time instead of a full-time mm -hmm. person. Um, and and the concept was that we would support startups, but there was a deep recession at the time, a little bit like, you know, bad economic times, like you might be experiencing a little bit now. And uh, we ended up supporting a lot of big companies because they laid off their staff, but they had contract dollars. Um, so it was it was a really interesting way to grow the business. Yes. Fully bootstrapped. 
Very cool. We started Digital Surgeons in 2006. Okay. <laughs> so right. right at the end. So we 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 sort of we were like, okay, let's. This is one a perfect bubble time. bursts and another one pops. Our first investors. We were talking to investors because we were going to raise money to start the company, and uh, they were all real estate guys, and they had said that they were very interested, and then. We put together a business plan and a deck and we went back to them and they were all sitting at the table, very uninterested, but also like really nervous. Most of them were like twiddling their thumbs and we were like, what's going on? And the boldest disruptor who wanted to make the investment passed away in the middle of the thing. So like no. two days of, of the documents, literally yeah. in the, while we were wow. creating the documents. For yeah, like two days before we were going to get the, we had already signed the lease. We had already hired the people. Holy you know, we cow. had the we had the handshake deal, and then our our investor passed away, so we had to figure it out. But all the the whole table was basically about to witness one the the housing crash. Yeah, and the one guy that was a was really a maverick was like, "No, I'm in," and then he passed away during the negotiations and the and the paperwork process, and uh, and that was it. So speaking of so, continuity, that's so, a great great so, great segue yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah. So now so now we started with twenty five hundred bucks or or each uh in the account and paid ourselves three hundred dollars a week so that was tough uh, that was our our start so now maybe you go babysitting babysitting <laughs> sounds like it was pretty lucrative back then or cutting hair right? yeah that's it. um like we talked about earlier so now you start your own business that's your first pivot um just really quickly things obviously go well because you sold it um how did you know when it was time to 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 let go of the business what was that like for you so it's, I mean, super interesting time. It was, we founded it, like we started in 92, we sold in 99. Um, and in between that time, like I, I remember at some point, like remarking um, in the early nineties, like, can you believe we're going to make it out of this century without anything really amazing happening in the last, like last part of the century? Like why'd you guys? <laughs> and, uh, and like then, you know, Al Gore invented the internet and we were off and running. So, um, I mean, you look at a lot that happened then, uh, TCP IP became a protocol. Um, ethernet was standardized. The internet became a, it became a public and, you know, became something public instead of private. Um, and so it completely changed our business. We were TCP IP based outsourcing company. And we ended up being at the very forefront of the internet. So we designed a lot of internet service providers, put a lot of ISPs online, helped helped with bringing the internet into the public space. So we worked with a lot of the, a lot like NearNet and PSINet and places like that. Um, and so completely changed the business, worked with a lot of the early websites. Um, we did all of the technology work for what is now Monster. Uh, and owned that IP when they sold to TMP Worldwide. Like the, Jeff Taylor came to me and said, "Like I really need the IP. I'm selling the business. Can I have it?" Like, um, no, <laughs> red check. <laughs> and it was because like no one contemplated at the time that they'd signed a contract that we would be writing code for something called the internet. Mm -hmm. um, so huge change in the business. Mm -hmm. um, so we grew from two people to about 55 people. We were based in Boston, uh, Mountain View, and Boulder. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, we sold in 99, we had looked at selling in 98 and 98 potentially would have been a better time. Mm -hmm. We sold as the bubble was, was breaking. So it would have been better to sell a little bit before that, but the timing was, was pretty tight in terms of the top of that, that market and the, mm -hmm. the bursting the year before when we were looking at an offer, uh, it was a, it was a company sort of a lot like us that had gotten bigger, faster than us because they had investment. And um, that deal was for a million dollars. And I remember going to my mother. I don't know why I was talking to my mother. She knows nothing about business. But mm. my mother, in her nothing about business way, said, that's not enough money. Like, a million dollars is not a lot of money. My and father thought, said the same thing. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, you know, I grew up with no money. And, like, a million dollars feels like a lot of money. She's same. Like, Don't, she's like, just, it's not, it's not enough, trust me. So I turned it down. Um, and then a year later, um, was approached as as this roll-up was happening. So we sold into a roll-up, a roll-up in the web hosting space to become the first application service provider, which wow. is really software as a service. So the concept that you could bring computing, uh, you could bring computing together into a facility and offer it in what we now call the cloud um, and break apart the the server client relationship. That's what we were doing. I'm a huge tech nerd, by the way. So like everything you're saying right now just feels like an episode <laughs> of um that was made. No, what was that? What was that beautiful TV series on AMC about? Oh my God, Halt and Catch Fire. Oh, sorry, Halt and Catch Fire is so good. So, Such yeah, a good yeah, show. Yeah, it's yeah like, so that, I'm exactly feeling that vibe like right that. now. You were literally in Halt and Catch Fire. This is amazing. Mm. That movie is is my life. Um, 
Yes. I love that TV show. So we, so we were the 15th of 27 acquisitions. They acquired our company. Um, we, we, we had about 55 people. We doubled the size of the company at that point. So we were buying really small web hosting companies, just, just buying up the, 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 the numbers. And then the next day they closed, um, they closed a deal that doubled the size of the company again. So a hundred people. So then we became, and that company was called Interliant, which was the biggest Lotus Notes hosting company in the world. Oh, wow. Lotus Notes being a thing at that point. Um, <laughs> you remember clients that used to be like, yeah, my whole system is built on Lotus Notes. Oh yeah, I still He knew what it was, Notes. I didn't know. I still miss Lotus Notes. So, and then we we took the company public a month later. So um, we, but but we sold the company at that point for five and a half million dollars. So like the, the offer- Thanks mom. Five, yeah, it was great. Thanks mom was absolutely right. Um, so that was super exciting. We were the 15th acquisition. I then helped roll up the rest like, rest of the companies, uh, you know, buy the rest of the companies. It was a trial by fire for you? Like you've never done that before? Obviously so. never done that before, but um, that yeah. was really fun. How do, you, how do you learn all that as like a math person with a math background? Like that's so inspiring to me. I'm like, how do you figure that out? Everything wasn't Googleable back then, right? Now everything no, is No, like not at all. As a matter of fact, like I remember... Yeah, it was a couple of years later where we did a video conference edit of a of a contract and it was it was simply that we were like on a video conference and able to see each other. It wasn't that we were able to do something online line because you would have to have word perfect to word line because word didn't actually redline things. Only word perfect did. Um so it was all highly manual back and forth. I don't know. I loved I love contracts. I love the the puzzling. I love the and I love selling. So like I was the key salesperson in my company and it was all solution selling. And when you think about buying someone's company, you have to figure out what makes them tick. What's the emotional trigger with them and then lean in on it to, to acquire them. Um, so yeah, it was trial by, it was trial by fire, but I loved it. I love buying. I, I love the whole M&A transaction process. So before we get into the, 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 what happens next, um, timing for entrepreneurs people call it luck yeah timing because if you're 18 months after that you were even in worse shape because that's when really things started to get really bad right. on the internet what do you tell you you've been in an ecosystem of entrepreneurs what do you talk about when it comes to or how do you advise them when it comes to timing and recognizing when it's time to fold when it's time to hold and when, when it's time to fold yeah so timing wise you know, there are a lot of elements involved with timing. I, I The key element is the person uh, and the company. So like if the CEO is ready um, to, to go on to do something else or like you feel like you've gotten, you've achieved your goal mm -hmm. um, and you want to see the company go in the next direction it needs to go to and maybe you don't want to be there. Like that's one of the key indicators that has to happen because no matter how great the market is, no matter how great the environment is, if that if that person's not ready to do it, they're not going to do it. So it, that that's a, a key piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, another piece of it is um, that it's really better to be in a good position when you're selling than to be in a bad position when you're selling. So if you think you're about to be in a bad position, it's better to get yourself buttoned up so that you're in a better position to be able to sell than it is to get yourself into a really bad position where you you have no options. Mm -hmm. So you really want to have at least that view of where you're at and what the health of the company is. I was in what is now called EO, Entrepreneurs Organization. I was in that. It was called YEO. Mm -hmm. um, I was a part of YEO. I highly recommend that CEOs of scaling and growing businesses are a part of some sort of entrepreneurial group mm -hmm. where they're engaging with their peers and learning from other people and picking up knowledge about how business works, about how business scales, about about how transactions happen because most CEOs and most entrepreneurs are not like, I don't understand what cap tables are. I don't, I, I can't tell you what a balance sheet is. Like they're not going to tell you that, but if you're in the room where other people are talking about it and you see what it is, you're going to pick it up and learn it. Mm -hmm. I remember most, the first time we heard the word EBITDA and we were, or, or the acronym people use that as a word these days, but we were like, what is that? Right. And you couldn't go look at like, so when I was on it, you couldn't go look it up like that. That wasn't an option. Yeah. So you had to learn it from other sources. Now you can like, someone can say something on the phone and you're like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I know what that is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you don't say like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Our EBITDA does this. I actually listen when I'm on conference calls now, I'll listen when I say something, if you see their face, 
to see if they're Googling it. Right. I had that happen recently where when we was interviewing somebody and you know, you get that feeling and you've, I'm sure you've hired a ton of people and you get that feeling where someone's just like not being true to themselves. All I wanted to, for them to say is, no, I've never heard of that platform, but I'm sure I could figure it out or something. And, but you could hear them Googling right. it. So I, I hear what you're saying. That would have been a nice time to live when it's like what you knew was what you knew and what you didn't know you had to figure it out. So. So I think you, you, you have to know the markets, you know, you have to understand the difference between, uh, you know, what, what a trend is, what a bubble is like, you have to, to know, you have to know what's going on. It, you're not gonna, it's an awesome environment to buy companies when they're down. Um, and when there's a down market, it's probably not the best time to sell. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a great time to consolidate. It's a really awesome time to consolidate. Like if you think you've got something and you've got a leadership position, you can pull people together in a down economy. It's a great time to pull them together so that you can come out of it much bigger and stronger. That's um, great advice. So sort of understanding how everything works together. You know, I still at that time, like VC was still just just a new thing. Mm -hmm. you know, now there's now there's a little bit more to consider, like what's the funding market like? Mm -hmm. Um and and what's the what's the macro and the micro around VCs and funding and how all of that's working and um, it's challenging to, to try to put all those parts together. So my other advice is get a mentor that can help you through it. Yeah. That's great advice. Here are the, uh, the math. That's like the calculus of business. I, I always, I always wonder when someone's background in your case, the math, um, I'm mad because the math teachers I had when I was younger made me dislike math when I was younger. And now I'm kicking myself for it as I'm older, but I could hear like the calculus of business, how you're sort of looking at all the formulas and everything. So. It's and I'm a math now. major because my geometry teacher told me in high school in 10th grade on the first day of class that all the girls were going to fail because girls couldn't do math. Mm. So, <laughs> so <clears throat> part of the show is progress pitfalls. Yep. So we did some snooping and we thought we found the pitfall, but I actually want to pass that question to you in your career, which has been amazing based off of what we can see. What was a, what what felt like a pitfall to you? It could have been a personal pitfall or a professional pitfall or both or something right. that across across the across the, the chasm. Sure, I think one thing people people ask me about a lot are you know uh, what is now called work life balance and um, you know uh, I get asked a lot about work life balance. I also get asked a lot about being a female in the room where there are lots of men. Um, I don't, I don't look at them as much as pitfalls, but I've had some pretty low times and, um, they would be during the time when I had my two bookstores and a coffee shop. Uh, and, and it was, wait, I, I, after, after Which is I, a pivot and now. Yeah. Pivot. So after I sold my business, I, I, I worked through the earn out and then I worked for, SoftBank Technology Ventures and Mobius Ventures as an entrepreneur in residence for a little bit. My never, job never heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> my job was and and I Brad Brad Feld and I like Brad was the co-chairman of the company who bought my my company. We were an EO together. Like we were entrepreneurs together in the Boston area. Um so my job was to start a company that they might invest in and after 9/11 happened, um I decided that I would buy the local bookstore in town. Um, and they were like, that's not really what we were thinking. I'm like, I get that. Like, I, you know, I'm going to have to to do this thing. And at that point I had two kids and a marriage and the marriage wasn't great. We had moved after I sold the business from, um, boss from the Boston area to Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And, um, I saw that move as a potentially good restart for a marriage that wasn't fantastic. So it was challenging to be married to someone who was home with the kids full time, who was a guy. Um, and to have me be the, the breadwinner. Um, and it was hard for my kids and it was hard for my marriage. So I wouldn't say I had the most balanced life. And that's way more common, by the way, that's way more common today than when you were doing it. It was not it common was at not all. not common at all. No, it was not common at all. Um, and so we bought this bookstore and then decided to open a second bookstore. Um, I would never recommend that anyone bootstrap a bookstore. That's just not a bad, that's not a good thing to do. They they have a lot of inventory. Um, and then I bought the coffee shop next to this one bookstore. And um, that, that, that was a pretty heavy load financially on us. They don't make a lot of money. Um, there was this thing called Amazon that was on the rise. Um, but it was in old Greenwich, Connecticut, which is 
pretty, pretty good place to be. Like people don't mind paying full price for, for things when it's a local business. And, mm -hmm. Um, so it was both a really awesome time. I was home full time with my kids. My kids were growing up. I got to see them. It wasn't a great time for my marriage. It put even more wear and tear on the marriage to have these three small businesses that, um, were challenging financially. Um, and then my kids started to grow up and my older, my older son, um, is bipolar and, um, he became very challenging as a teenager. I mean, like very challenging is, um, he was just very, very challenging. And my marriage just wasn't strong enough for that to survive. Um, yeah. And so that fell apart at the same time that the businesses weren't in a great financial position. And because of the divorce and because of the laws at that time in Connecticut in terms of how long how long you had to wait and how long things happened, it was a pretty long time. It was like uh, probably 18 months wow. yeah. um, of having to hold on to businesses that I couldn't invest in, that I couldn't get equity, you know, more, more money into, that I couldn't sell at the time because they were frozen assets in, yeah. in, in the midst of a divorce. That was really, really tough. And on top of it, I had two teenagers and one of them in trouble a lot. Yeah. Um, so that was a pretty low point. Yeah. Um, and when I had started the bookstore, Brad had said to me, oh, it's, you know, it's not what we thought, but just keep up with what's going on in the technology world. It's really easy. All you have to do is shut down the business if you don't, you know, if it's not going well, you just come back and we'll figure out something else. Mm -hmm. And so it eventually got to the point where it's like, I think I need to shut down this business. And, and our businesses were really well loved in old Greenwich. Like everyone came to the bookstore all the time. We had amazing parties. I had the kids that had rock bands there all the time. It was, it was pretty cool. Um, and I put out this press release that I was going to sell the businesses that, you know, if anyone was interested, they should let me know. And the town kind of rebelled against it. Um, and instead had a fundraiser to pay the bills. Um, so what was, what was, awesome was that that's how the town felt about it. What was also like a really horrible feeling was it was really handcuffed to these businesses. Oh, man. I mean, I really needed to make more money. I needed to get out and make money to support the family because I was, I was about to get divorced and had to support these two kids. So yeah, yeah, um, it was really, it was really challenging. And the housing market had just crashed. Oh my God. And so like I, when I got divorced, um, my, I did a property settlement on a house that was appraised um, 50% higher in value than, than I was able to sell it for. Oh, so like I had a big debt on, on the settlement, on my divorce settlement then as well. So it was a really, really challenging time. Wow. That, I was not expecting that. That was a, 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 an incredible <laughs> dive into that situation. I, and I loved it because it's real. And it, like, I just dealt with a pretty massive loss in my life, which was, you know, pretty low point in my life. My brother passed away in October oh, I'm sorry. Uh, from, from a really horrible cancer and just being around him and all that stuff. So, um, and people often ask me how I got through and more importantly, how I bounced back so quickly. Um, what advice would you give entrepreneurs about that? Because that sounds like jab, jab, right hook, uh, uppercut, <laughs> sidekick to the side of the face. I mean, that was intense just listening to yeah. it. And I'm so grateful you shared that. Yeah. So tell us how, like, looking back, if you could go back and talk to yourself or how do you think you handled it well? And if you didn't, how would you talk to yourself now? Go back and talk to yourself and say, hey, this is what you need to do. This is how you need to think about this. I think... Um... It's really hard to like, it's really hard to articulate the level of craziness that took place in that time period. Um, and if it gets worse, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I got anxiety thinking about it. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it, it was beyond intense. Like my, 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 it, it all sort of got triggered like by my brother's wife dying of cancer and my husband and I like really being the care keepers for her and my brother in the last four months of her life. And that put, that, that broke a lot of things. Yeah. So a lot of things broke all at the same time. I think that I've, I, you have to ask for help. 
I'm not really good at asking for help. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, how do you do that? (laughs) You're like, like you, it it just was like, there was no, I had no option other than to figure out how I could get help from people. Like I couldn't be in my business all the time. My staff at the bookstores were amazing. Like they would open, they would take care of everything that the, the, the businesses thankfully like had great people at them who were willing to make sure that they were working. Mm -hmm. Um, I was away. We were both like back and forth between, um, New Jersey, taking care of my brother and his wife a lot, and people would step in and just take care of the kids. And it became something where I didn't necessarily have to ask. I just had to accept. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that it was really, really hard. And then as, as like we moved out of that crisis stage and into having a teenager who was really, um, who was challenging every system put in front of, put in front of him and a divorce happening at the same time, that's when I, uh, I started going to Al-Anon a lot. Um, and I, I was probably going to Al-Anon three or four times a week and going to therapy two or three times a week. And it was like, it, it, it was the only way I could get, get through the week. There had to be someone there to, to be able to listen to me and say like, you're worth it and you have to put yourself first. Mm-hmm. Um, but also I had to make sure that I could take care of everybody, everybody at same, cause there was really no one else. Yeah. Um, there was really no one else who was going to step in for my family to take care. There was no, I had no, I have no financial backstop in my life. I have yeah. no, so there, it was like, I knew that, that the buck sort of stopped with me. So if I fell apart, then everything was going to fall apart. So that really wasn't an option. Wow. Take, take, take a breath. If, <laughs> yeah. No, that's amazing. I mean, I think what I'm hearing there while you're processing that, just to give you a moment, cause I know you've been through a lot and triggered some stuff is the importance of self-care and it sounds like you while you weren't great at asking for help you were smart enough to add some things to your life that created a sense of self-care that created almost like that blow off valve to to sort of get get some of that energy out you know in talking to a therapist al-anon etc to then get yourself back to a sense where because the buck stopped with you, you knew you had to get up and keep going. There was no other option. So that's what I'm hearing. So it's self-care, I think, is a word that gets thrown around a lot these days, but it sounds like it was really the thing that helped you. It was one of the things, if I'm hearing correctly, that that helped you to get through that. Besides, clearly, you're one hell of a resilient person, is what I'm hearing, and really grateful to this conversation. No, self, I think self-care is really critical. I My kid was, uh, my oldest kid uh, was rowing at the time, and... Um, he said to me, uh, he's like, I, I think you would really like this. Like, and, and I had been, um, I'd been a downhill skier. I'd played rugby. Like I liked sort of heavy sports. Um, and so I had started rowing right when he started, um, right, right when he started as well. And I will literally say rowing probably just saved my life. Like you could go out at five 30 in the morning um, and you know, there would be all these things that had just happened the night before, all these things. And, and you would come home from rowing and none of it was in your head. So it was that, that concept that you, yeah, by putting myself first and by taking care of myself, I was able to, to reset and I was able to be strong for other people at that time. Um, and also learning the boundaries there. That's where Alan on was also important. Like, Hey, it's not my job to fix everyone. It's their job to fix themselves. And so mm. I'm going to make sure that I'm strong and um, y'all sit with that stuff. Wow. <laughs> That's big. That's big. So look, we're going to move on. Okay. That, that was amazing. Uh, tons of nuggets there for people, uh, including myself and I think Pete, and I, I would agree. I, therapy helped me a lot in, in my journey, not with my brother, but prior to that. Um, in my relationships and everything. So I always tell people, especially men, men hate therapy. Um, <laughs> I always advise people, I just gave somebody advice yesterday to, to seek therapy, both for his couple's therapy between him and his wife and also for himself, because I think it can, it, it, it opens a lot of doors and it opens your eyes to things that created managers in your life and in your brain that you really need to get past in order to, to progress. So talking about progressing, we're going to progress the story here in, and we're going to go to MakerBot, yep. where you were the CEO from 2011 to 2015. Um, and I mean, I would imagine everybody knows MakerBot at this point. <laughs> so tell us about that. So I, wasn't you're living the, under a rock. I, I wasn't the CEO that, that, that whole time. So okay. um, I, I 
came to make red. It was my third job after I'd sort of exited the bookstores. Um, and I said to Brad, like, I need something good. Like I'd just been working for a medical devices company. I'd just been working for a solar installer like that, like managing 150 construction workers, not fun. Um, and I said, like, there's got to be something interesting that, you know, someone's looking for something. It's like, oh, you should meet this guy, Bree. He's the CEO of MakerBot. They just, they just raised money from Foundry Group. They just closed around. They could use some help. Um, they haven't run a business before. They haven't done this before. So I went and I met Bree and I, sort of typical sort of old Greenwich type person. I hadn't been to Brooklyn before. Like I hadn't been away from old Greenwich. Um, and so it was my first foray into Brooklyn and my first view of a 3D printer. And I was just like, holy cow, this is amazing. Like I have to work here. And Bree's like, that's okay. We got this. We don't need you. And I was like, no, no, like you don't understand. Like I have to work here. And um, I just wore him down. And <laughs> Bree's like, could you just tell this story? So could you just say you're tenacious instead of say that I didn't want to hire you? And um, so I finally got him to, to, we finally came up with a job. And my job was to be, um, uh, I was like head of people. I was like HR plus mm plus. -hmm. And we have 40 people. And I went in there and um, like there were, there was just no process. There was nothing for like, there was just nothing. Um, and MakerBot at that time was a kidding business. So we didn't sell fully assembled 3D printers. We just sold kits in heavy, heavy maker community, you know, open hardware, open everything, um, democratizing 3D printing, really interesting culture around the company. Um, and we were growing a lot and we had really ambitious plans. So um, went in and started putting, putting the, the things in place that you need to be able to scale a business with knowing that we had this $10 million and we wanted to get, to go somewhere with it. Um, and so I, I started there as the, you know, sort of head of people. I moved quickly over to run all of operations and my job was really to help the co-founders learn how to scale the business and what they wanted to do. Um, and there was a massive amount of change. When I started, there were 40 people. When I left, there were 650 people. Wow. Um, and it was a pretty short arc. Um, about a year, about a year into working at MakerBot, we decided to raise a $50 million round. Um, we had, you know, I had come in after a $10 million round. We hadn't spent any of that round, but we had really ambitious plans. We were bringing three new printers to market with five software products. And it, we were announcing at CES. And what people don't know is in that year, we had also shut down an operation in China um, and, um, exited one of the co-founders from the company who had been in China. So we had a product that we were going to bring to market through a Chinese manufacturing process that we decided to shut down. Mm -hmm. So we had gone, shut down the process and then, and then decided to bring these, these three products to market, which is incredibly ambitious. Um, and we were sort of a patent machine. We were filing, um, we were filing three to five provisionals a month at that time. So a lot of a lot of IP work, a lot of like, we really wanted to change the way the world of 3D printing worked. Mm -hmm. So we went out to raise this round. So it was about 18 months uh, into my being there, went out to raise a $50 million round. We we're running a really tight process because we didn't have a lot of time. We needed the money to, so that we could really run hard without having to stop. Um, we didn't really know what the use of funds were. Um, and that was actually the interesting thing where, you know, what's the pricing? What's the, what's the amount you tell us? Um, what you want to put in uh, and six week process. You give us a term sheet at the end. And Stratasys came to us probably two weeks into the process and said that they wanted to talk about a partnership. I was like, you know, partnership where we like, you know, uh, have a rev share together, a partnership where you buy us. And he's like, you yeah, know, partnership where we buy you. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you got four weeks because we're in the middle of a process and there's a term sheet due in, you know, in, in four weeks. So if you want to have an LOI in place by then, that's fine, but you've got four weeks to do it because you're competing against uh, the round that we're raising. Um, and they they were able to pull together um, a pretty complete process in that time period and deliver an LOI that um, that we signed off on. Um, and it was interesting. It was only in the last probably week and a half that they that they finally came came to our terms because I I started with if the number doesn't have 500 in it we're not you know we're not talking and they started at 300 and like they don't hear 500 <laughs> um and they just kept going through the process and they finally said that they would do four with a $200 earnout and it's like well now now we can talk yeah but it was in the final final week or so um of that process and so then we then we sold to Stratasys and um I stayed through that earnout what was the that 
by the way, the, the, your ability to modulate between such a deeply personal story to just the boldness that I see in, in the executive and you coming out, <laughs> just that modulation is just incredible. So I'm hoping that the listeners and the watchers just pick up on that because it's, it's a sight to see in person. So thank you for that. W the question I have is, so you went from tenaciously trying to find a job there to having a lot of different roles. What were the series of events that made you go into the chief executive role? So I, I, I think when we sold the company, I was like the chief strategy officer. Um, and I, I, we negotiated a president role for me in that. And then Bree, we, so, so MakerBot was growing a lot. So we were 40 people then. Um, we, when we sold, I don't remember how many people we had when we sold, but we were adding more than 20 people a week for over a year at one point. And then we built a factory where we like, you know, hired 200 people like in two months. I mean, it was, it was insane wow. amount of growth. We, we manufactured all of our own printers in Brooklyn. Um, so, um, it was a pretty, it, it was a pretty big operation. We had a, we had factory, we had a second, second factory building and then, um, and then the space where we had the office. Um, so I became the president and I remember one day, um, Bree and I were getting off the elevator and he's like, I just was, um, on the elevator earlier today and I didn't know the names of the people in the elevator. He's like, I'm, I'm like, I'm done with this. Like, I don't, I don't want to, he's like, this is not what I wanted to do. Like I, mm. he, he said, this is where I wanted the company to get to. This is what I wanted it to be. Um, and his goal had been to have the company be a public company and Stratasys was public when they bought us. So we were a public company, a goal achieved check mark. I want to go back to, to my roots. I want to do cool things. I want to do innovation. I want to, you know, get my hands dirty again and work with people, a small team of people who I know who they are. Um, and I said, well, let's, let's work it out. Awesome. So, so we did that and I became the interim CEO at that point. Fantastic. So <clears throat> in my career so far, I've met half a dozen to a dozen CEOs that have taken a company public um, or been a part of a company that was public. And I've never met anyone that enjoyed it. <laughs> I read some uh, some quotes about you or that you have said where you said, you know, going from being this scrappy sort of startup, you know, entrepreneurial startup to a public company is very, very challenging. What particularly was like, what's challenging? Why does everybody hate it? Well, there are a lot of rules. Um and and I've been a part of um, public companies twice, and um, the first time the rules were different than they are now. Mm. So when I was when Interliant was public, it was before um, there were rules in place that separated the um, analyst side from the banking side of 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 the investing world. So, um, it was a pretty cruel place. Um, and it was, um, so you could have an analyst meeting. The analysts would dig into your, your numbers and you had to, to expose a lot of information to them. And it was, it was just sort of a brutal world. Mm -hmm. Um, and now those rules have changed and there's, there's a separation there and, um, you don't get forward looking information. No one has that information in advance. It's, it's, it's not legal for you to share that information. So it's a, it's a little bit of a different dog eat dog world than it used to be. Mm -hmm. That said, um, you have to do everything by quarters. So you live and die by a quarter. If you succeed in a quarter, then that's, that's great. You succeeded in a quarter, but the, but then you start again, the next quarter you start over. It's not what happens within a year. So in your business, if you're missing, uh, in two quarters and you really blow it out in the next two quarters, you had a great year. In a public business, if you missed in two quarters, you missed in two quarters, you had a good quarter, but you still had those two bad quarters and they don't add up to a good year. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different way of, of operating. Um, and then there's a lot of, there's a lot of different rules. There's a lot of compulsory stuff. There's a lot of compliance stuff. Um, and you are beholden to, uh, to public shareholders versus the ones that you've chosen. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the, the, the difference between choice and being public is very, very different. You know, you're exposed in a very different way. 
if you had your if you had your your choice, I'd imagine you would sell to a private company and, and rather than taking a company public today, or would you still go down the route of going public? Oh, I mean, I don't think going public is the holy grail, um, and I think that you can you can do very well uh, as a private company or a public company. Um, it really all depends on what your expected outcomes are, or you know, like really where you want to be. If you want to take a leadership position in a really big leadership position and change the way the markets work, you're most likely going to uh, be in a public space. Got it. Interesting. So from that point in the journey, I, I know you spent a couple of years with little bits and as a new dad who, you know, my background's in design and coding, I love the idea of things like that, you know, Lego, little bits, et cetera. Um, I'd imagine just from, ethos of networking and being in the thing that's sort of how you came about little bits just from from the MakerBot stuff is that accurate so i um i don't know how i met aya i mean i i probably met aya from being in the foundry group family so she uh, foundry group was an investor and and so was true ventures uh true was one of our investors at MakerBot, so probably met aya from that and just being in the maker community um, but Aya had come to me and said, like, I, I want, um, I want you to come work for a little bits. And I was like, ah, I don't really know what I want to do right now. I want you to do for a little bits what you did for MakerBot. I'm like, ah, you know, like that's, that's like, there's a whole lot of factors involved in something like that. Right. So uh, 3d printing, like being able to have MakerBot go from where it went to, to, to where it ended up with was, was a huge bubble like in the 3d printing space like it was a huge change in democratizing what we were doing so you know i did caution aya that things wouldn't necessarily be the same but i could come and put the spine in the jellyfish i could come and you know operationalize and and help her get to that point with scale and that's so that's what i really went over to do again another first time ceo where i was able to take my background in terms of how you operationalize and scale and work you know work a company to scale versus growth um, and help the CEO, um, you know, be in service to the CEO. My job was to be in service to the CEO at MakerBot. My job was to be in service to the CEO at Little Bits, and my job was to be in service to the CEOs at TechStars, as well. Um, so that's that's sort of how I ended up up at Little Bits. Interesting. So <clears throat> now yeah, we, I know we were talking about that balancing act. I know you were probably going to go into that next. Yeah. So TechStars, you had two ro two titles, two roles. I don't know if they were at the same time or if they were separate. But you had the COO role and you had the CIO role, Chief Innovation Officer. When I think of that, I think of like a train, like a car crash. <laughs> right. You have disruption, and and uh, I wrote <clears throat> you have disruption and you have structure. Right. Something that I'm awful at. Structure operations is something that I'm I'm not capable of. I concur with that statement. <laughs> um, how do you balance the two? Structured your, disruption. Yeah. How do you how do you balance the two in your brain? How did how did you how do you go from being innovative and disruptive, or, or how did you bring structure to innovation? How, like where did you how did you play there? So I think you know innovation at its best has structure inside of it. So pro process, like one of the things that when I went to Little Bits, I I said like you know what's the process for this? Who's in charge? Like they're like whoa, do you want to like get fired early on? Like you can't say those words here. Um, process is actually makes things work better. So having some sort of operating system on how you do something means that you're able to move further faster with something. Um, you're able to fail faster. And you have a mechanism to understand how you're succeeding with innovation or not. So I believe that you need some sort of structure with innovation. Innovation is not just sitting around, you know, throwing shit against the wall and seeing if it works. Definitely not. You need a thesis. You need to know what you're doing. You need to know what you're testing. And then you need to know what happens once you test that. And so that's my view on innovation. And I think that at the heart of most innovation, that is the, the loose process that you use. Now, it's different than operational operational process, operational yep. process, you know, you put in place a flexible process that meets you where you're at <laughs> and has a future for where you're going. Um, so that you're able to efficiently, you know, efficiently get there. That's, that's how you scale things. Um, and so they were, they were two different jobs. So I started as the COO, we had two CEOs, they needed someone to operate the business. We were in, we had maybe 15 to 20 accelerators in three countries and we wanted to grow the footprint. 
the, the global footprint, as well as the number of accelerators. When I left, we were in 15 different countries with 55 accelerators. So it was a pretty big, big jump. Yeah. Um, and there wasn't a lot of process in place. So putting in place the the systems of how people work together, where do you find things? What is the basic operating system was, was what I was doing on the operating side. On the innovation side, it was wrangling and managing all the different ideas that people had mm. um, to figure out, you know, what you pay forward and what you kill. And you really should, like in a real innovation funnel, you should really be killing 80% of what the ideas are and taking forward a small number of them. Mm. Said well. I'm so curious as someone who created a community here in New Haven at District and has been in and in the circles and in the conversations with the governors and 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 other states have called me in to to talk to them about how to build a district type of environment in in other cities. Techstars has built so many Every city, small, every town wants a little tech stars. They want some type of e entrepreneurial ecosystem. They all believe they can create one. What did you see in your experiences uh, at tech stars um, that has to be present in these towns and communities to, to, to have an entrepreneurial ecosystem that thrives, that works, that operates, that, 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 that goes through uh really the 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 life cycles that you've seen work well like what's that been like it's helpful if there's a university or a college nearby so that there's a, or some sort of you know ecosystem around learning and people coming out people coming out looking for work so it helps if there's a there's some of that there needs to be some interest in investing um, it doesn't have to be institutional. Um, it, it can be angel. It, Connecticut has a really strong angel community. Mm -hmm. um, and it can also be state-led. So, you know, good state funding. And in fact, some of the, you look at some of the Midwest states, you look at um, some of the, like the Appalachians and, and places, places that are sort of not in the center of the world. There's really good state and local funding as well for, for entrepreneurship. Um, and you, you obviously need people, um, to be able to, to do that. So you don't, you don't need a lot. Um, but in order to have an accelerator really take off, you need a strong mentor pool. So you need people who've been there, done that, who have that experience as entrepreneurs, not as just business people, but as entrepreneurs, you need to have enough people who are going to invest into that. Um, and you need to have some way to recycle and recharge that. So that's where, uh, you know, a talent pool that comes out of somewhere like a college or, or, you know, some sort of feeder system, mm -hmm. um, is, is what you need sort of on the basic, uh, on the basics. I think if you haven't read the third wave by Steve case, it's a good book to look at, Great book. um, where you can look at, you know, like how you do this outside of like all the big hubs. If you just sort of shift a little bit and look at like some of like, look at Pittsburgh, Carnegie yeah. Mellon's right there. You look at Cincinnati, since he's a great place, like, you know, it's, it's, it's places that have been at the center of industrialization that are maybe waning are really great places to go look. They, they have the basis of all of that in place mm -hmm. from the work that they've done. Detroit is a great place to look at. You know, it also is hungry for change, hungry for innovation, mm -hmm. you know, really, really uh, has the incentive to make that change happen. I love some of Brad Feld's essays on that topic as well. He's, he's written some great stuff. And the the start the book that that um that Brad and Ian and Chris Startup um, Communities. Startup communities. So, so uh yeah, Chris Hively worked for us, worked for worked with me at, at Techstars. Um you worked with Brad on this startup. It, it, Wendy Lee was on our mm -hmm. was on our board. Wendy Lee um ran Centrifuge and uh in Cincinnati is now is now responsible for um sort of the rural ecosystem, rural entrepreneurial ecosystem in Colorado. Um, so like it's in, it has to be intentional, but you need those elements and mm. you need like, you can't say this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. You can't say, oh, someone from outside is going to come in and make it happen. You need to have community that, that wants to come together and not own it, but create it. Got it. And you brought tech stars to Connecticut, right? You did tech stars with Stanley. Yes. Yep. That, that must've been sort of 
rewarding for you to have lived here for so long, for seeing what Connecticut has to to offer, and then being able to bring uh, a, an organization and a, and a process. Well, clearly uh, Jenny's an expert at putting spines in jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. So, so Jim Larry and I both went to Union College. We're on the board board of trustees together at Union. We we're always sort of swapping notes on. You know, he was always swapping notes with me. Like, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? Can I do something there? Can I do something here? And MakerBot like sort of whetted his his appetite there. Um, and then uh, when I went to TechStars, he's like, oh, I think that there's you know there's something there. So we started talking about about how we could get an accelerator here. And um, no, it was super exciting to get that accelerator there to, to like see how Stanley has supported the ecosystem, the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Connecticut has really, really worked on economic development in Hartford, bringing together all those elements, working with the colleges and the universities and, um, and the, you know, bringing entrepreneurship, bringing jobs, bringing opportunity to the area. Like it's, I, I love the way that Stanley has approached that. So and, being a part of that is. was great. Yeah. And, and they still are. I mean, we, they brought us in now to as district to come in, sort of be the glue that brings the pieces together in That's some awesome. type of an environment. They're still working on the funding aspect of it. And there's a lot of work that has to happen because, as you know, it just it takes – a village to make these things work. It takes lots of funding, state funding, and so on and so forth. Not just a, a corporation. Everybody just thinks a corporation and a college it takes a lot more than that. No, I'm talking with Marty this afternoon. In fact, <laughs> I spoke to Marty yesterday. That's so funny. Yeah, no, it's, it, but it's great, and it's people like like Jim Lurie and Marty that really just no matter what in adversity and knowing how difficult it can be, especially in an environment like Hartford. That's you know it's crazy. Hartford went from the number one city in America, like. To, to the literally, I think it was the the least successful city in America. Right. Wow. You know, the, like rise and fall, and to have people like Jim Lurie and and a good mayor and and good people around that trying to to figure out a way to 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 push innovation and to push an economic development initiative is is important. Speaking of pushing, I'd love to, if you're okay with it, push us Let's into go. the next stage in the journey. Sure. Clearly, Jenny, you've had this. You know, clearly a intuition as to knowing when it's time to move on to the next thing and that sort of thing. So back at Techstars and now, you know, off into the Glowforge um, sort of era. So like what, what, what was that? What moment inspired that um, to sort of come back and then go to Glowforge? And then I'm curious, how did that then lead to academia? So for me, that, that arc is just, it's, it's interesting. And I, I just love the way your mind works. So tell me more about that. So I didn't go to Glowforge. Um, no, no, I, I invested in Glowforge, but, oh. um, uh, I, when I left Techstars, um, I, I wasn't sure that I was going to, what I was going to do. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to do something other than, other than sort of the typical stuff that I do, which is work with startups in terms of where they want to get to and, and, um, help them get there. Um, and so teaching was something that I'd always, was always sort of on my bucket list. I don't have a lot of bucket lists, but it was one of them. My parents are both community college teachers and I always thought it would be sort of cool to do. So, um, I had an opportunity to create, uh, an entrepreneurship program and teach it at Sacred Heart. And so I did that when I first left Techstars. Um, and it was cool because I used the basis of, um, a startup weekend, uh, to, to anchor how the class worked and then like worked through, um, all the elements of what you need to strengthen a business and then had a demo day for the class. So it was, it was a really cool, cool exercise to do. And it was great to do during the pandemic. It was a little weird to do during the pandemic. I taught the first class I taught at 110 incoming freshmen who had never like who wow. did everything virtually. So it was a little bit of a challenge. Um, but I then realized that that's not really my calling. Um, it just, it just wasn't quite what it was. So I was working on, um, I was thinking about starting a fund of funds to help emerging fund managers. Um, I really think that there was a gap between, um, the funding between seed and series a, for underrepresented founders and really was was interested in closing that gap and understanding that gap better. But at the same time, also really felt like there's not a lot of support for um, founders as they leave an accelerator, like that they don't really know what they want to do. to They don't know how to scale their businesses. That's why I got hired as a COO to come in and do it with people. And it's not very rewarding to me when I leave there to find out that the CEO hasn't really learned what I know, but they need to know that. 
Like mm. it, to, to be a complete CEO, you need to know how to operationalize your business. You need to know what it needs to be able to scale so that you can hire the right team to do it. Not so that you do it yourself, but you know the elements of it. And so I started talking with Matt Blumberg, um, who's one of the co-founders, CEO and co-founder at, at Bolster. Um, and I've known Matt since he was at Return Path back in the Mobius days. So I've known Matt forever. Oh, wow. Like we're in the same orbit with Brad, with Brad Feld, this sort of Brad Feld orbit. And we realized that we live somewhat close to each other. He lives in Scarsdale. And so I said, like, why don't we get together over this pandemic that's sort of getting boring and we can swap notes on what we're doing. Um, and I really wanted to start a fund and also a program to help startups scale their businesses. And he said, like, why don't you, like we want to do that at Bolster. Why don't you come do that with Bolster? So that's how I ended up at Bolster was like common interests, you know, a passion of mine, sort of where, you know, maybe a final thing that I'd like to do before I get to retire. So um, that's how I ended up at Bolster. Very cool. So what is it that, just for the audience, like what is it that Bolster is doing and, and why do you think that now is really an interesting time to be doing that? So Bolster uh, helps start up, CEOs scale themselves, their teams, and their boards. Sorry, could you just say that one more time? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Bolster helps startups scale themselves, their teams, and their boards, and, and we do it in three different ways. We have a boat, we have a marketplace that brings um, senior level, executive level talent to startups. So they've self-identified as people who want to work with startups. And um, it's a marketplace where a startup can come find someone on an anytime basis. So on a fractional, interim, project, CEO, mentor, you name it, you can find someone. Um, and if you if you don't want to find it yourself, we'll do that, that for you. Um, we do a lot of board searches. We've sourced members so that it's very diverse. So we have like, I think 45%, um, more than 45% of our members are female and um, just about that same same number are uh, from an underrepresented group if you count females. So like we have a great diverse slate of candidates for people to range from. So that's the bolster marketplace. So first issue that startups have when you say, what's your biggest problem? The first thing they say is talent. So it's an available talent pool. It's an affordable talent pool. It's the senior talent that you need to be able to scale your business with. The second program that we do that we have is Bolster Prime. That's what I'm running. Bolster Prime is an 18-month mentoring program that, that partners a startup CEO with a CEO who's been there, done that, a seasoned CEO, mm. um, to help to mentor them to become a scaling CEO and to scale their business. So we marry it with content on how do you scale, like what are the foundational elements you need to have in place to scale your business. Um, and they are mentored over that 18 month time period to meet their scaling goals. We charge a mix of cash and equity for that. And then we have a venture fund that invests in a subset of those companies. So we co-invest alongside other people in a subset of those bolster prime clients, the ones that are at the right stage for us to invest in them. So we also uh, have a venture fund and I'm um, you know, general manager in that fund. Fantastic. It's so interesting when I look back at that beautiful journey. That's really your career, which is still evolving. Of course, it sounds like putting puzzles and pieces together when it comes to people, products and companies is this just really a, a life of service and ecosystem. And it's just, it's interesting. Have you ever sort of looked at what drives that through line in, in the career and, and how it sort of all ended up? It's interesting. Like, you know, some of it is I like doing different things. Like, so I, I guess I've always sort of looked at it as like, I like picking up things that have elements of things that I haven't done before. Um, and I have this decision matrix, this spreadsheet that I've made that that's a decision matrix. It sort of looks at all the things that are important to me to do intrinsically, all the things that are important to me to do extrinsically, um, and understanding the value they have to me as well as society so that I can look at like, what's the best option for me to be working on. And when I look at that, like, there's not a lot of things that I'm looking to pick up, a lot of experiences that I'm looking to pick up. I've done a lot of different things. I'm old. I mean, quite frankly, I'm I'm almost 60. So yeah, you're not old. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you know, with with an experience base, then you want to be able to apply it and I want to be able to share that, share that with other people. So what's the right platform to do that? And I think that probably over the last 15 years, that's been most of my most of my focus. Like, how, how can I how can I take my experiences and, you know, I can learn and grow from them by sharing them with other people. Because every time you work with people, mentor people or in service to people, you learn as much as I think you get 
as much out of it as you give. So like, it's always worth it to me to give a lot because I get a lot out of it in return. I love that. You said something when we were doing the research that really struck me, which is, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to seek help all the time. Um, earlier in the conversation, you said that asking for help is something that you've, you've struggled with. You had to almost accept it at some of the hard parts in your life. Um, I'm someone that struggles with asking for help, asking for advice. What's some advice that you'd give to me and others like me who need the advice, want the advice, but don't know how to ask for it? So I think, um, I think a mentoring relationship is one way to do that. You know, uh, it, it's an implied ask for help. Um, and it's less asking for help and more a conversation. Um, so do I just send Jenny an email and say, Jenny, will you be my mentor? Yeah. Like, so like a mentor is an intentional thing. Careful. You might get that email. That, that's fine. I, I mentor a lot of people, but it's that, you know, I want to, I want to learn and grow from other people's experiences. So one thing I'm, I'm a very impatient person. And I'd rather, I'd rather take a set of experiences that I can use as my own and pay it forward. Like, mm. this is how I talk about with Bolster Prime with our CEOs. Hey, like we can tell you how all of this works and I can, and trust me, it works like this for everybody. I know you think you're different from everybody, but it works like this for everybody. So you can take that set of experiences, use them as your own and go forward. But like, then you're going to run into these things that they are unique. They are unique pr problems. They are, you get to spend your time on those. And then you get to learn them and unlock those and share those with other people. Like that's, that's sort of my goal. Love that. And, and so like having a mentoring relationship with someone where they know what you know, and they also then know what you don't know and they help you get there. That's a way to ask for help without actually saying I need help. Interesting. No, that's a really beautiful ask. I've in 20 years of doing this, I never thought to ask somebody to be a mentor of mine. I think there's been a lot of people who have mentored me without me asking for it, right? which has been fantastic. And I'm grateful for all of you, but no, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful transition. Is, is there any follow-ups that you've got on that day? I do. I, I, just, I have one question. <clears throat> so Pete and I have always run into this dilemma where we're both visionary types and therefore there's never been a spine in a jellyfish <laughs> and somehow we made it. Well, we've, we've, we've made lots, it. Of, lots of backbones, very few spines. Yeah, uh, lots of backbone, but very few spines. And somehow we've been we've been able to survive 16 years. We've made investments. We've built on top of the foundation that he's we. A, he has a very hard skull. <laughs> yeah, we've built on top of the the foundations that we've created. Um, <clears throat> when when I split off to to create District, Pete stayed in the business. Um, I accidentally found a COO who brought. Um, at the book Rocket Fuel talks about like the visionator, vision and the integrator, visionator. That's a, both people together. Yeah, it's like the Terminator. It's, it's AI empowered. <laughs> the, yeah. The integrator role. And, but I accidentally found one who was just really great for me, helped me operationalize things for district. And, and, and honestly, I think a lot of the success happened because she was able to operationalize my crazy sort of mind uh -huh. and, and, and vision and help push things forward. As I think towards the future of businesses that we might create or we might invest in that have visionaries, what's important? Like, what? How do you spot an, a, a good COO? How do you find your Jenny, or in my case, my Joe? Right. I mean, I, I think that um, look, there, there's no formula. Uh, it would be nice if there was a formula for everything, but you don't have a matrix for that. I don't. <laughs> I know. I was hoping for like, I was like oh, here's my Excel yeah. sheet. <laughs> well, I have a little matrix for that. So yes, I knew there was a secret sauce. There, there's a four box matrix that um, that I use, where in the upper right corner you write down the things that you like and are good at. In the lower one, you write the things that you don't like and are good the at. The zone of genius box. It's is that is that what it is? Yeah. There's a book on. Is okay. that the same one? Every I time mean, I come up with something, he tells me that there's a book on it or a theory or a principle. And I'm like, I, I, I no, don't know. No, this is awesome. I'm wondering if it's yeah. the same one. So, so you, you look in that upper, you like, you want to be in the upper right box, yeah. right? Um, and so you write down the things that you're good at and like doing, and you write down the things that you're bad at and like doing, right? And then you also write down the things that you're, um, you write down the things you're good at and don't like doing like that, 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 that half of the box is really important. The upper left one where, where you're bad at and like doing. So, so one of the things that was fascinating at Techstars, is I mapped out my team, almost all of my team was in the bad at don't, but like doing. So I meant like 
oh, we think that there's potential. We want you to learn how to get over there. But like, these are people running a, a business, you know, part of the business. They should really be in the I'm good at and like doing space. So you try to hire people who are good at and like doing the things that you are good at and don't like doing. Mm -hmm. um, you want to position yourself in the good at and like doing space. And so like, I like to look at that sort of like, you want to have someone who like, who has the qualities that you, that you have in a, any of those other boxes, mm -hmm. you should only be in that upper right. And they should only be in that upper right as well. That's sort of what you want. You want a little bit of overlap though, between the two of you. Like, it's not very good if you're, if you're, if there's like space between you, there needs to be some overlap in terms of, and that's what gets you to be able to communicate and share and be able to have a common language with each other. That's great. I actually ask, and so I don't think I've heard you say that before, and I didn't know about the zone of genius because you've seen me say it to people. I often ask people that we're hiring those questions. What are you good at that you like doing? What are you good at that you don't like doing? And so on and so forth. And I go down this thing because number one, I believe that everybody has to, I only like to hire people that have self-awareness. Right. Right. And then number two is it gives me a sense of like, where do I want to make sure I don't put you because I don't want turnover. Exactly. Yeah. Right? So that, so just not, not even from like a finding a good person in operations. I just want to know those things because I think it's important because we, as humans, we we have those characteristics of doing things we like to do and doing things we don't like to do and so on and so forth. I, I won't, if someone, you know, I, I ask the question, like, tell me something you're really good at, but don't like doing. Yeah. And if it's a core part of their job, then the, like they don't advance. Like yeah. it's just not, they, they're going to be an unhappy human the entire time they work for you. Yeah. I don't yeah. like hiring unhappy humans. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. I, Cause it's an, I often talk about business having energy. Right. I think I think above and beyond all the things that, uh, you know, being being early, being disruptive, being in the right marketplace, having a good kager and so on and so forth that people look at in businesses. I think if a business has good energy and the energy comes from the people, it's going to be have a higher likelihood of being successful or uh, being able to overcome failures. I think that the other the other one is like the um, culture proficiency scale. Mm. Um, so. This this is a this is a mistake almost every business will make in particular with hiring their salesperson. Mm -hmm. um, they will hire or or their tech person. They'll hire someone who's highly proficient, but not aligned at all with how the business is set up and what the business is doing. Mm -hmm. So not culturally aligned. And and cultural is actually the wrong word to use, but I'm just using it right now. So. A highly proficient person who's not aligned with how the business, you know, not 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 values aligned with the business, is the most dangerous person you could hire. They, Unpack they, that for us. I want to I want to understand those signals because they they will not be value aligned with how you're running the business, mm. and so they will be disruptive, and they will come in and cause problems because while they're really good at what they do, they're going to roll their eyes and not agree to any of the rules or any of the, the mission or any of the core values in the business. Interesting. So you want someone who is value aligned and proficient, but you want to index on that value alignment over proficiency. Um, if you find someone who's highly proficient and value aligned, that's really awesome. But to hire someone who's a sharpshooter who's very, very proficient, but not value aligned is a huge, huge mistake. And, mm. and they can flip the values in your company. And if you flip the values in the company, you, you potentially, you know, you can go from being highly value aligned to being really, really in a bad place mm. when the values in the company flip. So I happen yeah. to happen to MakerBot at MakerBot. We were an open source hardware company. We were for makers. We were democratizing the world. And like when we took venture funding, the company was like, well, what's that about? Because now suddenly we were about, you have to return some number of X to your investors. Mm -hmm. So you're suddenly sales aligned and you started doing things differently to, to raise revenue. One of the things we did was we closed a little bit of the hardware and a little bit of the right software. Here. Yeah. And, and we had, we had a huge value alignment problem as a result. So people who were really aligned before that, when we changed the core values, yeah. The whole company changed, yeah. and overnight, people were not the right people. Like so meta, funny. Meta, Meta's having that. Meta, Meta, Meta. People think that Meta may not be around in a few years. Facebook. So because and of Twitter. Meta. I mean, look yeah. at what. Yeah. Look at like that. The, the problem with with what's going to happen if one yeah. thing was to connect the world, and then all of a sudden they wound up mm -hmm. becoming a massive disruption and hurting 
and, and, and hurting the world. And I think that they, they're not, they, a lot of people think that they can't win at the metaverse because no one trusts them. That's right. a, that's an interesting discussion that I'd love to have with both of you folks when we have <laughs> another few hours, we'll call that episode two, Jenny, but, um, the, Nadala at Microsoft, the CEO said that GitHub was one of the transforming aspects of their culture is going back to open because if we recall, obviously it's such a proprietary right. thing. Um, I want to go back to that, that culture proficiency that you were discussing because a, I'm selfishly curious about it and B, I know for a fact that all the audiences now in the future will get value from this conversation. Talk to us and talk to founders about what are the signals that they can look for on the day to day where you can see that they're in the, they're under indexing in, in the, in the right, the wrong areas when it comes to that person who comes in highly proficient, but not value aligned. What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it feel like? Yeah, I think it, it looks like, you know, the person who, um, who won't use the tools that, that you have, who, who talks about, Oh, like this is the way we should be doing this. Um, you know, who yeah, it's sort of weird, like, you know, won't join in, won't participate. Um, is I, I'd say you sort of look for what is undermining and also political behavior. Mm. So, you know, back channeling, um, like you, you can, you can, the back channeling thing, like you can get a sense of people doing, like you can feel it happening when it happens. Absolutely. So is like p politics, you know, put, putting people against each other, um, either intentionally or unintentionally or bringing their, Hey, d yeah, can you believe that they, they do that? Like, I don't want to do it this way. Like, do you agree with the way we're doing this? I don't agree. Like, let, let's have a riot sort of is. You used to call them well poisoners. Remember back then? Mm -hmm. that, 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 that is, yeah. they, they, they do poison the well. Yeah. The struggle for, I think, entrepreneurs is the, telling the difference between someone that's trying to bring some structure to your business. Cause we've done that in our own business. I mean, let's just be real here. We bring mm -hmm. people in that bring tools and structure to our company, which to the point of, you know, being the jellyfish with no spine, we needed. And then there's a revolt against that because of the way it was. But we know that, you know, we've used the analogy that Pete and I are like two Ferraris tied to each other, driving in opposite directions sometimes. So we grew to a, to a multi-million dollar company, but we've never been able to sort of get that rocket fuel where we've gone, for, say, 10, 20, 30, 50 million, $100 million company. And we've seen companies do it. And it's sort of like, well, what's the issue? We often look inward and say, okay, it's we don't have the right process, we don't have the right tools, we don't have this. It's and, us, it's us. Yeah. And 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 what we wind up doing is we wind up with a lot of people that we bring in that say we should be doing it this way. We wind up with some people that come in and say and and revolt against the tools that we have that we that we just put in place. And it sort of feels like we're on this, you know, seesaw. And it's like you have to find that balance of what is real. And what is just someone being, you know, quite frankly, an asshole. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it, like, you know, you need to look at what your strategic plan is. Like, mm -hmm. you can have as little, as heavy or as light of an operating system as you want. But, you know, you need to know what the strategic plan on, what the core values are in the company. You know, how yeah. you're going to operate on a day-to-day -day basis. And that that's how we work here. No, I yeah. love that. I, I think the the big takeaway for me that sounds like we're all in alignment on that I think everyone can get value from listening in the future is it doesn't matter what the kernel of the operating system is more than, more than the fact that there is some operating Correct. system. A absolutely. One, I, I, 100%. I, I'm like with Bolster Prime, I intentionally do not tell people this is this is the operating system. Like go read traction. That's the operating system yep. that we're like, it's a great book. It's a great, it's a great operating system. If that's how you want to operate. Right. Um, like you need to, you need some way to operate. People need to come to work every day and know how it works and know how it works. Otherwise you just have chaos. And then like, that's just, that's not a really good, good use of time or, or money. And people don't feel good about it. Like, cause they don't know where they don't know where they're going yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's so it's such an interesting, I think, great place for us to to wrap up. I think in terms of yeah. this, this conversation's been really inspiring. So I'm so grateful for it. I and I'm really grateful for just the vulnerability and the things that you've shared. I think that's what that's why we're doing this is that it's not just a place for people to plug, you know, what they're up to at the moment, which obviously bolster sounds awesome. So I'm definitely going to dig into it a little bit deeper and everybody else should as well. But um before we wrap up, is you know, how do folks clearly there's a lot of wisdom that you've got in that beautiful mind of yours. Where can folks read about it, learn about it, check it out? Like any, anything that you want to plug that we can stay in touch on? Uh, you know, that it, 
I don't, I don't have like, I've written blogs, you know, there's, um, I've, I've, I've written various things, but there's not a lot out there that I've done in a, in a sort of uniform way. Okay. Um, you can always email me. Okay. Any um, places that you'd want people to check out or tune into besides bolster? Um, I think. Like, do you have a TikTok, Jenny? Oh, if you go to, if you go to old vent, uh, old school venture.com, you should hit up my, like, I, I think it just goes to my medium. Okay. Like, and so like, you can see all the haiku I've written and fantastic long form articles I've written. So we'll put those in the show notes for everybody to check out. And again, Jenny, thank you so much for the time today and for tuning for everybody tuning into Ford Obsessed. This was truly a Ford Obsessed conversation. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Ford Obsessed. Please share this episode, subscribe, and leave a review on your podcast app. This episode was hosted by Pete Senna and David Salinas from the Digital Surgeons Podcast Studio in New Haven, Connecticut. Special thanks to our AV team, Steve Walter and Meg Olson. Ford Obsessed is produced by Robert Roach. If you'd like to contact our team, visit us at FordObsessed.com.